Each week, Richard and Father Mark present a rigorous discussion of the Bible in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. Over 24,000 episodes are downloaded each month at no charge. Please consider marking your level of support with a one-time donation or by pledging a small amount per episode. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Human beings make decisions and take actions based on assumptions. We do so because without assumptions, we are paralyzed by complexity. In some cases, an assumption is based on data, but almost always our presuppositions stem from innate selfishness. As Julius Caesar once said, men are nearly always willing to believe what they wish. Caesar himself assumed that mob sentiment would ensure his triumph. Unfortunately, most people approach Mark's gospel with Caesar's worldview. We want Jesus to be popular. We want the mob to love him, and no matter how hard Jesus runs from the crowds, no matter how emphatic his desire not to win them over, we still cheer when they surround him. Why? Because in our hearts, we prefer Caesar's victory to Jesus' defeat. Richard and I discuss Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 150 of the Bible as Literature podcast. When people hear the New Testament, they begin with the assumption that there's something called Judeo-Christian civilization. That's where they begin. And then from that premise, they go to the New Testament and they say, we have the Judeo-Christian perspective and we have the Roman perspective. And then they assume that there's a difference between those two, but the New Testament keeps telling us there's no difference. There's no such thing as a Judeo-Christian perspective. There's scripture and everyone else. In the Roman tradition in late antiquity, you have a society that is totally at the mercy of the mob. Because even though the emperor had total control over Rome and was worshipped like a god, The fact is, if the mob was not pleased with Caesar, it undermined his power. So politics in late antiquity, politics today, frankly, nothing changes under the sun. But politics in late antiquity in Rome was all about controlling and manipulating the emotion of the mob. That's why Mark Anthony was so important to Caesar, because of his popularity. Now you have also the scribes and the Pharisees, whom Paul in Galatians accuses of the same behavior indirectly by defending himself because they accuse Paul of trying to please the people. But Paul makes it very clear in Galatians, what I'm saying and doing is extremely unpopular to everyone and my only purpose is to please God, not to please people. So that's the paradigm. You have it clearly that the Pharisees and the scribes and Roman politicians and Herod are all playing the same game which is the popularity contest. When we look at Jesus, a lot of times we bring in our presuppositions about what a good leader is and what a good person is. This is why Jesus elsewhere gets angry when someone says, oh, good teacher, because it's, what do you know of good? We try to fit Jesus into our paradigm of what is good. We come to the text assuming that Jesus is good, but we assume that he's good in the way that we want him to be good. So I think this section we're looking at today, Father, really challenges the way that we understand what is good because we think of the good pastor in the church who's always taking care of people's needs and is always ready to respond to what they want and that sort of thing. But like you say, Father, this is pleasing people. It may or may not be pleasing God. If you are hearing this text as a Jew or a Roman in late antiquity, it is difficult for you not to be frustrated with Jesus. Because in your mind, the crowds are the most important player in the story. In your mind, doing favors for the crowd 
is the most important thing Jesus could do in order to bolster his movement and gain popularity and gain leverage so that he could force his agenda, blah, blah, blah. But Jesus is not interested in pleasing the mob. He's not interested in pleasing anyone except his father. So in this passage, for those who reject the presupposition of scripture and hear scripture on the basis of the Judeo-Roman presupposition that the will of man supersedes the will of God and that what pleases man is more important than what pleases God. If that's your presupposition, Jesus to you is going to look like the bad guy, like the one who is dismissive of the crowds, who doesn't care about the people. And once you make that judgment, you fall in the trap of judging God when you yourself are the one who's engaged in the abusive behavior. In this short section, verses 7 to 12, the sledgehammer is this trap that exposes the false presupposition, which is what Jesus has been doing all along in the first part of Mark. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. What's interesting is that the scribes and the Pharisees began to conspire against Jesus with the Herodians, which is a classic political move. We talked about it last week. Jesus should be saying to himself, I've got all the crowds. I've got the mob with me. I can organize this and undermine the Herodians and gain ascendancy. That's what you would expect, but that's not what happens, is it? Right. He goes to the sea, and when you look and see the great multitude from Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. So Tyre and Sidon are in modern day southern Lebanon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing. People heard the word that was coming from all around. Now don't forget, Jesus has been trying to keep the crowds away. Don't forget earlier when the crowds came to him at the house, he snuck out in the middle of the night. Whenever a crowd comes to him, he tries to get away. And when he does something, he says, please don't tell everybody because it's going to create a crowd. Jesus is not trying to create a crowd. Jesus is not trying to get a big group of people to follow him, to come and press him into doing what they want him to do. I challenge every parish council, every community, every church, great and small, when they get together and they worry about their existence and their future and their security and their success and their growth, which is all the language of Caesar, I challenge them to read chapter 3, verse 7, and explain to me how their growth campaign, which they call their evangelization campaign, which is absolutely an abuse of the word, I challenge them to show me how their growth campaign is compatible with verse 7, where Jesus is running away from the mobs they're trying to get a hold of. Jesus is trying to create a circle of people who are absolutely dedicated to getting the word out. So anyone that presses him and keeps him from moving and keeps him from getting the word out is in his way. I remember a friend of mine who studied Aikido, and his teacher one time said, you know, I want to put a sign on my door that says, go away because I'm tired of getting students who come in here who aren't serious. This is what Jesus is trying to do. Jesus is trying to eliminate the unserious people to get out of his way so he can go and find the people who are serious and get the word to them. So don't tell me the Bible that Jesus is carrying needs your inside community. Because in the story of Mark, he's running away from your inside community. Consistently, systematically emphatically running away from it and you want to convince me that he needs it in order to carry the Bible no I said it in the first year of my ministry and I've said it many times since then all you need is ten dollars to buy the cheapest copy of the Bible at Barnes & Noble that's all you need you don't need anything else except maybe a Greek dictionary and a Hebrew dictionary if you want to really read the Bible what else do you need Oh, Father Mark, are you saying Sola Scriptura? No, I'm not saying Sola Scriptura. Luther said, I like Romans. I don't like James. With all due respect, that's Sola Luther. That's not Sola Scriptura. 
I'm interested in someone who really looks at scripture and takes all of it end to end and deals with it and doesn't say this works for me, this doesn't work for me. Come on. But you're saying sola scriptura, Father Mark. No, I'm not saying sola scriptura because I don't believe in the personal relationship language because that's the language of Caesar. That's the language of Pharaoh. Everybody wants a personal relationship because they want power. You are not in relationship with the king. You are his subject. Read scripture. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crowd him. So he wants to get in a boat and get out into the water so that people can't follow him. This, Jesus is trying to prevent the crowds from following him. This is what's so counterintuitive to us because we think that the good pastor, the good church, is trying to get more people to follow and is trying to bring more people around him. Jesus just says, the crowds are going to get in my way. I need to make it across the Galilee. The way I can do it without people getting in my way is by boat. But aren't we all supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus? No. no. Jesus does not want personal relationships with these crowds. He does not have time to have a personal relationship with you. You are not on the agenda. If you already heard his name, that means you had your chance to study scripture. There are others who have not been fed. There are others who are in need. We are so narcissistic and self-centered. He has to carry the scroll to the nations. Just look how Jesus avoids the crowd. He snuck out in the middle of the night. He gets on a boat so the crowds can't crowd him. We're only beginning chapter 3. For he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. And here, those who begin with the worldly presupposition could fall easily in the trap of accusing Jesus of not being a man of the people, not bowing down and serving the people and submitting to the people. That's because your version of submission is evil. Because your version of submission is like giving praise or giving thanks to other people in order to get something in return. You want Jesus to bow down to the crowd because you want Jesus to bow down to you. The word has gotten out that he's able to heal people. So all these people with afflictions want to touch him. But interestingly, in scripture, God is trying to move away from what you can touch to what you can hear. No one is interested in pressing around him in order to hear him or to listen to him. They want to touch him. And so for the crowds, he's simply an idol. You touch it and you're healed. It's a magic trick. Which fits right in with the ancient religions of the Roman Empire. Every house had a different cult, a different statue, but it all boiled down to a sacrifice, a magic trick, a dance with smoke and flame and whatever. So Jesus wants to escape them because they are not serious. They don't understand him because they're not listening. They do not understand scripture. They do not understand what he is teaching. They're not crowding around him in the synagogue as he's teaching. They're crowding around him after he's done teaching so he can heal them because they're not serious. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. Often in the gospel we hear in the epistles, we hear it in the different gospel stories, this idea, and it comes from the Old Testament again, that people give lip service to God, but in doing so they work against him. So you can proclaim the correct thing, but it can function against the gospel. In a way, this undermines theology because people are so obsessed with the correct formulation about Jesus. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. So technically what the demons are saying is correct, but they're not saying it out of respect. They're saying it the way someone shouts fire in a crowded building because they are reveling in the fact that the mob is blocking Jesus. So they want to create traffic, more traffic, to obstruct Jesus. But then what does Jesus say? He warns them not to say who he was. Do not tell anyone who Jesus is. Now, again, it's not because Jesus is having an identity crisis. This isn't about Jesus' ego. It's because the mob is a problem and Jesus is neither Roman nor Judean culturally. He is a son of the commandment. It's not who he was, but what he says, because neither the crowds nor the unclean spirits 
can live up to those words. Now, it's interesting what you say, Father, because the unclean spirits, it doesn't say if they're disembodied unclean spirits or if they are inhabiting human beings who are saying, Son of God. Because it is possible to say Son of God, yet still work against the commandments because you're a hypocrite to the words that you say, which human beings fall into all the time. Of course. And so, don't talk about who I am. All it does is create more crowds and more people want to be healed who misunderstand the whole program. The point is, is not simply to bow down, not simply to recognize who he is, but to follow what he says and to do as he says. Obedience, not falling down, is what is important. Not taking from Jesus, not celebrating Jesus, not loving Jesus, not feeling great about Jesus. It's about the obedience. It's about doing what Jesus says according to Torah. This is exactly what the people need to hear. It's important to note that Jesus can't announce who he is anyways until his father says he can. And so your point about obedience is well taken. His job right now is not to go, look at me, I'm Jesus. His job is to preach. And until his father is ready for him to be crucified, he has to do what dad says. It's all about obedience. It's about the command chain. And we could stress this forever. It's not something that I think is easily accepted in this culture. We've hit on this many times, the importance of the command chain. But I think that there are venues in American culture that can help people understand what Paul is saying and what Mark, Paul's disciple, is saying about authority in the command chain. In late antiquity, the Roman household, where you had clear paternal authority, was the vehicle Paul chose for the gospel, which was analogous to the household of Abraham and patriarchal authority. But to understand Jesus' absolute deference to the command chain and the expectation that others would show deference to his command and to the command of those he sends in his place, you just have to think about an American corporation. In an American corporation, the CEO is a Roman patrician with absolute authority. And everybody who gives lip service to civil rights, civil liberties, freedom of speech, when they go to work at a corporation, they reemerge themselves in ancient human history because they do whatever they are asked to do up and down the command chain without question. It, Why? Because they want money. And what I propose is that if Americans could think about this corporate system that they give themselves over to chasing money, if they could just reprioritize the teaching but give the same deference to the command chain expressed in the Bible, there'd be hope for them. My kids were walking through a parking garage on Black Friday, and someone came up to them and said, do you believe in Jesus? And they said, yeah, sure. And they said, okay, well, say that he is the Son of God and invite him into your heart. And they said, okay. Now, what's interesting reading this passage is even the unclean spirits can say Jesus is the Son of God. It doesn't take a miracle to say Jesus is the Son of God. But... What's the implication of that? What do you do about that? And like you say, Father, you obey, you follow the command chain, and you do what is commanded. You know, we're going to wrap up today a little bit early, but we wanted to take a moment to talk directly to our listeners about our website, ephesusschool.org. If you have ideas or questions, we invite you to comment on our posts on the website. You can send us a message on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. We have a page in Facebook that you can link to from Ephesus School. Give us a visit. That's ephesusschool.org, E-P-H-E-S-U-S-S-C-H-O-O-L.org. Look forward to hearing from you. Take care. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.